Hello, and welcome to the third lecture of Type Systems. So in the last lecture, what we saw was uh, how to specify the operational semantics of L1, and then we looked at an implementation of it in ML. And on, on our uh, course website, there's also an implementation of uh, L1 in terms of in the Java programming language. And this is worth looking at a little bit, uh, just because you'll see that the, the, the way that uh, code is structured in ML and Java is quite different. So in ML, what's done is that uh, we have a data type of expressions. So we give one data constructor for each of the grammatical constructions in the language, and then we define operators like reduction by cases on the uh, on the possible data constructors. And if you look at Java, you'll see that it's like sort of inverted. There's a class for each data constructor, and then each class has methods giving the behavior for things like reduction and type checking for, for each constructor. So in an ML-like language, uh, you the functions group all the cases together and uh, in a uh, in a Java Java or object oriented language, the methods are grouped with the data constructors. So, like where the where the code goes in uh, each language is a little bit different. And uh, you know this is a this is a useful fact to know when you want to move between like uh, uh, ML style languages like ML or maybe Rust to Java style languages like Java or C sharp. So being able to uh, switch between these two views is is rather handy when you're trying to write idiomatic code in either language. But this this is a class about semantics, and where we'll we'll focus more on the actual semantics of the language. And when we wrote down the operational semantics. Uh, we made a lot of choices, and I want to highlight some of the choices that we made out. Like there's language design choices that are embodied in the semantics of L1, and let's let's come bring some of these out. So, for instance, for our our rules for operator evaluation, said that E1 has to be fully evaluated before you start evaluating E2, and so what this is, means is we're sort of specifying left to right evaluation. So we're saying first evaluate E1 until it's a value, then evaluate E2 until it's a value, and then perform the operation. So what this means is that once you've specified this order of evaluation, uh, effectful operations, effectful expressions, will have like a, a, a very specific uh, um, order in which they modify the store. So for instance, here we are adding two expressions, L1, L gets set to 1, semicolon 0, and L gets set to 2, semicolon 0. And so both of these expressions will return the value 0, but this one will set the, uh, set the location to 1, and this one will set the location to 2. So when you evaluate this program in a series of five steps, first what you're going to do is you're going to set L to 1, and then you'll return 0, and then after that, you'll set to L to 2, and then you'll uh, return 0, and then you have 0 to 0. And what will happen is that the state will go from 0 to 2, and this is, uh, this is very definite. Um, the semantics doesn't give us any other choice. And we can change the order in which we, uh, we evaluate these arguments by changing the semantics of uh, uh, the semantic clauses for, uh, for the uh, uh, evaluation. So for instance, if you wanted to do right to left evaluation, we could replace our op1 and op2 rules with the two other rules, op1b and op2b. And what op1b says is if e2 takes a step to e2 prime, then e1 op uh, e2 will step to e1 op e2 prime. And so what this is doing is it's saying um, you always evaluate e2 and you only evaluate E1 in op2b when the, when the second operand is a value. And so these two rules will jointly specify that uh, arithmetic and Boolean operations will evaluate from right to left. 
And so in this modified language, if you evaluate L1 is set to uh, 1 semicolon 0, and then you add it to L gets set to 2 semicolon 0, then what will happen is you still get the value 0, but the store no longer is set to 2, instead it's set to 1. So some of these boring looking congruence rules um, that just seem to propagate, propagate the uh, the uh, that just see that that just seem to uh, find a position in the tree to do some evaluation actually have a serious impact on the evaluation order of the language. And when you have the uh, when you have proper when you have things like store, the evaluation order of the language can change can can change what you get in memory. Um, and some other languages, and so like for instance, Java actually specifies the left to right order in a very definite fashion, but a lower language level language like C or C++, it doesn't say. It says they can be evaluated, the, the arguments can be evaluated in any order. And this has, uh, uh, this, this, mean, this is why uh, the result of uh, evaluating uh, arithmetic expressions with two side effects in them is has undefined behavior because the C standard says, well, I'm not going to commit to any particular evaluation order because I want the compiler to be allowed to use whichever one is the most favorable one. And if you write code like this, which could make that evaluation order visible, the results are unspecified by the language. And compilers are free to do anything they like. Um, a second, a second choice that we made is in our uh, in how we specified assignment, and so our rules for assignment, assign one and seek one, say when you see L gets assigned to N, it evaluates to skip, and then it updates the store with by setting the location L to uh, to the integer N, and if we see a uh, uh, a skip followed by an e2, then we just evaluate e2. And so the uh, the uh, uh, choice that we've made here is that uh, um, the assignment operation results in a skip, and a semicolon only progresses if e1 is a skip and not for any value. So if you had like n semicolon e2, our semantics would just get stuck. Um, an alternative you could have is to say that uh, an assignment returns the value that it was assigned. So l gets assigned to n would step to n comma the updated heap. And so what this would let you do is it would let you chain assignments. So if you had L1 is assigned to L2 is assigned to L3 is assigned to N, then all of L1, L2, and L3 would be set to N. Um, so that's that's a that's a, a nice convenience, but it means that you have to change the the sequencing rule. So instead of saying skip semicolon E2 steps to E2, you have to allow any value at all to uh, to appear in that uh, in that first position and uh, let's see in fact yeah let's let's actually take a look at how these how these would be different Okay, and so here in in the OCaml language, we actually have uh, assignment as a uh, as a uh, something which takes a, a a location a value and returns a, a unit. So if we if we define some uh, some locations, and let's set L one, L two, and uh, L3, let's define them. And now what we can do is we can uh, we can try to do a chain assignment here. So if we do uh, L2, L3 gets assigned to L2 gets assigned to L1 gets assigned to 3, 
we're going to get a type error and it says well this expression has this unit type and what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, assign it as the target of something with an integer in it and so what we can do now is we can redefine uh, we can redefine a uh, the assignment operator and we can say well first set it to x and then return x and so now what we've got is a function which takes a reference and a value and then returns the new value. And so now what we can do is we can try to do this triple assignment and the triple assignment returned the value three, which was this uh, three right here. And now let's look at the contents of uh, L1. It's a three as we expected. L2 is also a three and L3 is also a three. So, you, so we get different behavior. Okay, um, so another, another choice that we made was we said that when, you, uh, dere when we do dereference and assignment, um, what we had to do was we had to uh, check the domain of the store to see if L was actually in that domain. So the store is a partial function that maps some but not all uh, locations to values. And whenever you do a dereference or an assignment, you have to check that the uh, that those registers or locations are actually are actually in the store and otherwise you get stuck. Um, so there are alternatives you could do. So you, for instance, you could implicitly initialize all locations to zero, or perhaps you could allow assignment that uh, to initialize an L. So if you assign to a location that doesn't exist, then you then you uh, automatically in, uh, allow that initialization. And one thing that might be worth thinking about is what are the consequences of these choices. So. Uh, um, why do you? Uh, why, why might you want to make these choices, and why might you? Uh, why might you wish to? Why might you wish to avoid them? So the advantage of store initialization of having a pre-initialized store is that you know you don't get the uh, the errors when you uh, try to uh, write to a location that's not that's not defined, and that's also the problem because what if you made a typo? Uh, it would be nice to have some sort of error rather than like your program just silently doing something you didn't expect. Um, and this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, a choice where the where the benefit and the cost are sort of the same thing um, will come up a lot, and we'll see we'll see this come up again when we start talking about type systems as well. So in many cases, like the the, the same feature is the benefit and the cost depending on what your perspective on the uh, on the problem is. And finally, uh, one additional thing is that our stores only contain integers. So they're finite partial functions from locations to integers. And we have rules saying that when you dereference a, a location, you get a number. And when you do an assignment, the value that you store has to be a number and we can only store integers. So if you try to store a Boolean in a location, then you can't, uh, then you can't make any progress. The semantics get stuck. So we can't store Booleans, we can't store units. And so you can ask, okay, well, why not allow storage of any value or even of locations? Um, and so, or, or, you know, for that matter, why not even store uh, programs in the heap? And so, so the, uh, the, the choice here, the choice that we made restricts expressiveness in, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, as, and you can, you can make your language more expressive by, by letting it store more kinds of, more kinds of data. Um, so for instance, in ML here, uh, the references can store anything. So here we have an integer reference, but there's nothing stopping you from having a, a, a reference that stores a function. And so now our L4 is a reference storing of a, uh, a function from integers to integers. Um, and so that, that enables uh, um, 
quite exotic programming styles. So the uh, the other thing we thought about when we when we thought in the previous slide of uh, of store initialization is uh, is well we we considered initializing store on assignment but another alternative which we saw with OCaml is to not uh, not auto initialize store but let you allocate new locations and so later on in the course we'll look at uh, programs that behave like uh, um, ML and let you allocate new locations as your program uh, as your program executes. Um, so, so you can see that there's a lot of potential dimensions of variation and extension, even already in this very simple language. And uh, you know these uh, there's a final there's a final uh, there's a final language design point, and this is a uh, a fact about more about our implementation than anything else. So. Um, in our language, we specified booleans as their own their own grammar of values, and they're not integers like in C, where uh, where zero and not zero take the role of the boolean values. And you know, okay, that's just our language design choice. But something that isn't just purely a language design choice is that the L1 implementation and its semantics are not quite in step. So if we go to the to the uh, syntax uh, to the data type declaration, we have right here that uh, we have a clause that says integer of int, and that looks okay, except that the grammar of L1 and its operational semantics said that uh, any integer was allowed, and right here uh, in this data type expression thing, integers are just ints, they're machine integers, and machine integers have a bounded range. So they would be uh, uh, 32 bits on a 32 bit machine and 64 bits on a 64 bit machine. And so uh, what this means is that if you pick a maximum integer and you add one, then it's going to, uh, it's going to overflow. So let's actually even see, uh, see this in action. So if we, uh, define, say, the factorial function. If n equals 0, then 1, else n times factorial of n minus 1. And so, you know, many of these will work as you expect initially. Uh, okay, so, you know, factorial of 5 and factorial of 10 work. Well, what about factorial of 15? Okay, what about factorial of 20? What about factorial of 25? Oh my. So um, in ML and Moscow, OCaml and Moscow ML, integers are stored in a 64-bit word. And when you try to, when you try to uh, um, add two integers together that, that overflow that, it wraps around and gives you a negative number. And obviously the factorial of 25 is not negative. So the some operational semantics of L1, which is implemented by machine, uh, which, which is specified using arbitrary integers, we implemented using a machine integer, and now we have a mismatch between the implementation and the specification. And so when, whenever you build these kinds of reference in, uh, interpreters, uh, this is a, oh, oh, pretty much always a very serious point because uh, um, whenever the specification and the uh, implementation aren't in alignment, then there's opportunities for compilers to miscompile things when they uh, when they incorrectly believe that a transformation is safe, and it's also uh, it's also an opportunity for uh, for attackers to uh, to um, to break your break security invariance of your program by exploiting the fact that a program might have been written assuming one semantics and it was implemented using a different semantics and that mismatch can allow uh, um, all kinds of bad things to sneak through so you so you when you see when you're, whenever you have a case like this you have two choices either you can repair your implementation and stay in alignment with the semantics or you can uh, repair your semantics to stay in alignment with the implementation. So, um, like either choice is valid, um, and uh, 
but 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 one of them should be made. You shouldn't allow like the the uh, the semantics to be like sort of an aspirational document uh, that's far away from the implementation because that makes it very difficult to uh, judge when a particular behavior is a, is a bug or or not because you don't know your your because your semant your your specified semantics is what you use to judge whether your implementation is uh, is is correct or or has a bug in it and if your semantics is wrong then you that that just is going to make your life as a language implementer much harder and your life as a programmer using that language much harder if you can't trust the language specification okay so l1 was a very small language and uh we can ask well it's a small language is it good enough to write something interesting and the answer is both yes and no so on the one hand, it's a Turing complete language. We've got integers, we've got arithmetic, we've got loops and conditionals. We can code, uh, we can code any kind of like register machine or Turing machine in, in, in L1, and that will work. Um, but if you like really try to push on this, you're going to suffer. Uh, and the reason is that like a, L1 doesn't have any data structures. There's no lists or trees or objects or modules or functions. So there's like uh, no way to really develop your program in a structured modular fashion. So even if you wanted something like lists, the way that you would uh, the way that you would need to uh, um, encode a list, uh, say a list of integers, is by taking binary representations and coding them into uh, into uh, sufficiently large integers, uh, which is not so great. And what's more, the absence of functions means that when you want to, say, take an element out of that list, you're going to have to reproduce the code to uh, to um, do that binary coding and decoding every single at every single uh, use of a data structure in your program. So in theory, it's an expressive language. In practice, it's not. Um, okay, well. That would that would that's uh, that gives us an agenda for things to add for the rest of the course. Um, but here's another question: is perhaps L1 is too expressive? So uh, maybe we can write programs that we don't want in it. And so an example of this are programs like three plus false. So this program just doesn't make any sense. And um, if you if you try to run our evaluator on it, the program will just get stuck. Um, and that that can be implemented, say, by a runtime error, and uh, it would be nice not to get those. It would be nice in this case, because it's so obviously a mistake, to report the error early at compile time rather than late at runtime. And so the our mechanism for uh, for uh, supplying programmers with early errors is what is called a type system, and so. Here, what would happen is we'd say, well, false is a Boolean, and the addition operator wants to take two integers, and so therefore, this program won't type check. We can reject it statically. And so we're going to talk, we're going to talk now about type systems and how we might type the L1 programming language. And so the before we do that, though, it's worth, uh, it's worth uh, uh, talking a little bit about what type systems are for. And uh, the purpose of a type system is fundamentally like intended for humans. So it's intended to help programmers understand and, and language designers describe when programs, certain programs make sense. And this should let them rule out certain kinds of errors statically. And once you have this, you can use it for, uh, for doing things like structuring, uh, structuring the programs that you write. So if you know about the type structure of your program, you could write your program to, uh, to align with it. So that uh, um, the abstractions you built are accessed only using the uh, the uh, uh, sort of the methods of the abstraction, rather than like letting implementation details leak everywhere. Um, and it's also helpful when you're designing a language because uh, um, what one thing you can do, for instance, is you can have a certain implementation strategy in mind, and you can use a type system to rule out programs that can't be compiled use or implemented using the implementation strategy that you want. 
Um, and so the idea is that like if your static semantics uh, um, is good, then it'll be helpful to programmers and it'll be helpful to implementers. And um, uh, in order for this to work, um, you really want to make sure that well-typed programs like don't get stuck. So in our operational semantics, we represented nonsense states as uh, as stuck reductions. So you have a term which isn't a value, but it can't take any it can't take make any progress. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to say, well, if once it passes the type system, there are no programs that get stuck. And so in that way, the semantics that you specified um, sort of completely specifies the behavior of like um, of all programs that can actually that can actually get accepted by a compiler. Okay, and so the point here is that um, the operational semantics we wrote down is not an implementation; it's a specification. And we saw that we specify in the in the last lecture. We saw that when we specified a programming language with a set of inference rules, and then we tried to write a little tiny interpreter for implementing those reductions, there were a reasonable number of choices that we had to make. We had to we. We couldn't uh, copy the rules one for one. We needed to use a little bit of creativity to actually implement the reduction rules as an ML program. And so this leads to, uh, and this, this, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of choice um, only gets more, more and more important as the implementation strategy gets better, better and better. So if we were compiling to machine code, say, then we have a much, a much bigger question when, uh, when we face a program like three plus false. Like, so what should we do? Um, and so there are generally two kinds of uh, runtime errors, um, and these are generally kind of called trapped and untrapped errors. And so when you have when you have like a erroneous program, a trapped error says that the execution will halt immediately. Um, maybe you'll get a segmentation fault. Maybe you'll raise a top level exception. Um, but at any rate, when you hit a program that doesn't make sense, execution stops. Um, and the programmer gets a hard error. Um, and there's a, another kind of error, which are called untrapped errors. And these are errors where uh, the, when you write an, uh, an, an ill-formed program, then the, the implementation makes no effort to detect them. So what can happen in this case is that the implementation, in the, the semantic invariance can just get corrupted. So, for instance, in uh, in a C program, if you write past the uh, the end of an array, the the lang the compiler doesn't check this, and there's uh, literally nothing stopping you uh, from uh, from doing things like uh, um, overwriting the uh, overwriting the uh, the code of your of your program with bytes that correspond to um, an entirely different program. And this this uh, is a really nasty problem because the semantics of the language tells you nothing about what will happen. Um, so the the uh, untrapped error can corrupt the invariance of the runtime system, and now your high level semantics tells you nothing about the actual behavior of the of the program. So this is what C calls undefined behavior. So it's undefined behavior because the C abstract machine, the C uh, reduction semantics doesn't tell you what will happen in this case. You hit a stuck term, and then the actual C program can execute any old uh, behavior that it likes. Um, and so trapped errors are much better from a programmer usability point of view than untrapped errors. And the reason for this is that uh, is that the uh, abstractions of the semantics will never be broken. So the worst case is that your program crashes, but at that point of crash, you know what something went wrong, and you can look at the uh, uh, you can look at the uh, uh, program and reason about the program in terms of the semantics of the language. Um, in contrast, an untyped an untrapped error has the problem that 
once an error occurs, you can no longer use the language semantics. So when I talked about uh, memory corruption with a C program, what happened was we talked about C right up until the point that we did uh, out of bounds memory write. And then at that point, the only way that you can uh, talk about what's going on next is in terms of the actual machine code. Like no longer can you think about C, you have to think about the actual object code that got compiled. Um, and this is a, a substantially bigger lift. So, so um, a trapped error, though, can still be bad. So, for instance, if you're trying to like submit your taxes and the tax website keeps uh, signaling an error, you still have the problem that you haven't paid your taxes. Um, and so... Uh, it's good that you're not like accidentally paying the wrong amount of money, but it's still bad that you're not able to pay your taxes. Um, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to ensure that languages are safe so that all the valid programs don't have untrapped errors. So all errors that happen are trapped. And moreover, you'd like to have as few trapped errors as possible. So perhaps the program will crash, but uh, um, we'd like to, that to happen as, uh, as infrequently as possible. Okay, so to, to specify this, what we want to do is we're going to introduce what's called a typing relation. Um, and so the idea here is that uh, um, we, write, we write this as, um, as gamma turnstile E colon T. And we read this as the expression E has the type T under assumptions gamma. And these assumptions gamma are all about the locations that can occur in E. So um, for example, according to the upcoming definition, what we'll want to be able to, what we want, we'll want to be able to do is we'll, we'll want to be able to say that uh, if true, then two else three plus four is an integer. So three and four and two are integers. Um, addition takes two integers and gives you an integer and a Boolean con uh, a, a conditional test want, uh, tests a Boolean expression and then it wants the two branches to have the same type. So that, that makes sense and that's what we're going to specify. And we'll also want to be able to say, well, if your program dereferences a location, um, we want to make sure that uh, um, our type system will rule out the error of accessing uh, um, uh, uh, uninitialized memory. And so what we'll do is we'll have a list of assumptions, L1 int ref in this case, that tell you which, uh, which locations are actually in the, uh, uh, that will actually be in the store. And so this is saying, well, this program is going to do if bang L greater than or equal to three, then dereference L, L1, L3. So it's sort of giving you L1 clamped to a minimum of three. And uh, we want to say that this has an integer, but only when this location L1 is actually, is actually uh, promised to be available. So we're assuming in this typing derivation that uh, L1 is available. And once we've made that assumption, this expression should have an integer type. But on the other hand, what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to rule out more programs. So we'd like to say that three plus false does not have a type, it's an ill-typed program. And likewise, if true, then three else false is also an ill-typed program, that it doesn't have a type integer uh, because these two branches have different types. Okay, and so the, uh, the way that we're going to define our, uh, our type system is first by giving some more grammars. And so we're going to say that the type of expressions can be integers, booleans, and units, and the types of locations can be integer references. And what we're going to do is we're going to let gamma range uh, be the type environment. And it's going to be the set of finite partial functions from locations to location types. So in this case, our only location type is an integer. This is something we're going to uh, relax later. And so we're going to write a gamma a, a type environment as a list uh, L1 colon int ref to LK colon int ref. And that what that's going to denote is a finite function mapping L1 to int ref all the way to LK to int ref. 
And so you can think of gamma as the map that tells you what type of each location has, and the domain of that map tells you which, uh, which locations are, are actually available. Okay, and so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to specify this typing relation by means of giving rules. And so just as we saw with the operational semantics, what we're going to do is we're going to give a few rules that sort of seed this relation. So this relation is relating three things. It's relating a term, a type, and a set of assumptions. So it's a three-part relation. Um, and you should think of this as a sort of uh, um, infix or really mix-fix operator. So, uh, so this turn style relation is a three-part relation re relating type environments, expressions, and types. And the way that we specify membership in this relation is by giving a set of rules. So we're going to seed this rule, this, uh, this relation, with rules for integers and booleans. And we're going to say n has the type integer uh, for any integer n and any set of assumptions ga gamma. And so no matter what gamma and n you choose, it still has, uh, uh, that integer will still have the type int. And similarly for Booleans, regardless of whether it's true or false, it has the type bool for any, for any possible type environment gamma. And that gets us started. And so now we can use this and say, well, if you know that E1 has the type integer and E2 has the type integer, so in other words, um, gamma e1 int is in the typing relation and gamma e2 int is in the typing relation, then we can say that gamma e1 plus e2 has the type integer. Um, similarly, we can say that if e1 is an integer and e2 is an integer, then e1 greater than or equal to e2 is a boolean because we're comparing them for which one is bigger. And notice here that again, just like we saw with the operational semantics, they've got two, these rules have two readings. You can read them top down or bottom up. So if you're viewing, we're building a re we're building up this relation. You can say, well, if e1 and e2 are in the relation, then e1 greater than or equal to e2 is going to be at the relation, but at a different type. Um, but you can also read these rules bottom up. So you can say, well, if I want to find out that E1 plus E2 has the type integer, I need to check that E1 has the type integer, and then I need to check that E2 has the type integer. So you can read the rules either as progressively building up a larger and larger relation, or you can view it as deconstructing uh, a program in order to ensure that it's well typed. And so that's the top-down versus the bottom-up reading of these rules. And you should be comfortable with both of these readings. Okay, so now um, conditionals. And so what we wanted to ask is, when does if e1, then e2, else e3 have a type t? And the, uh, the answer that we're going to choose is that we're going to say, well, if we're doing a conditional, then E1, the scrutiny of the conditional, has to be a Boolean, and then the two branches, E2 and E3, have to have the same type T. And well, one, one point here is that this is a sensible rule because it means that uh, regardless of whether this branch takes e, the, e, the then branch or the else branch, we'll get a value of type T. Um, so, but it's not like sort of the most aggressive rule possible. So you could imagine saying, well, if, if, if I have a typing rule that says if true, then E2 else E3 only checks E2 because you know that you're never going to evaluate the E3 branch. Um, and that would be something you could do, um, but A, it's of limited use and B, it's not a very, uh, uh, it's not a very regular sort of rule. So one thing, one thing that's convenient in a type system is if you can make it as syntax directed as possible. So if you can just read the term um, and that tells you how to type check it, then that makes it easier for programmers to understand the rules. And adding a whole bunch of special cases is uh, sort of antithetical to that. It makes it harder for programmers to understand because it makes this bottom up reading harder to, uh, harder to get a hold of. Okay, and so now we already have enough to check some interesting programs. Um, and so what we can do is, uh, 
we can give a typing derivation like this. So if we want to check that if false, then two else three plus four uh, is going to be uh, a conditional, and we want to check three things. We want to check something about the the scrutiny, the then branch, and the else branch. And the false is obviously a Boolean according to the Boole rule, and two is an integer according to the int rule. And then for the else branch, uh, what we're going to need is we're going to need to show that three plus four is an integer. And here I'm going to write a little triangle to say this derivation tree I'm going to copy down over here just to make things fit on the slide. So here we're saying, okay, three plus four is an integer because the op plus rule tells us check that the two operands are integers. And in this case, from the literal rule for integers, that's, a, that's immediately the case. So we're able to build a derivation tree using our rules, showing that if false, then two else three plus four has the integer type. And that tells us that this program is in the typing relation for in integers under the uh, empty set of assumptions. Okay, and so now we get to the part of the, of the, uh, uh, of the type system where we start talking about the store. And when we talk about locations and assignments, then we need to actually use our set of assumptions about uh, uh, in, the, in the typing rules. So starting bottom up with the dereference rule. So we say that the expression uh, dereference L, bang L, has the type integer when gamma of L is equal to int ref. And so what we're saying here is that in order for dereferencing L to be well typed, the location L has to be in the context gamma and it has to have the type int ref. And similarly, when we do an assignment, what we want to check is that the location has the type int ref and the expression E has the type int. And so now, We've replaced. Uh, now you can see that what what's happening here is that the typing rules contain like some assumptions about the runtime store, and we're checking that the program satisfies these assumptions. So you can think of gamma as the demands that we make on the runtime store. We're saying, well, when you run this program, uh, the runtime store has to match the assumptions in gamma. So all of the locations mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the uh, typing assumptions gamma, they all, at each location in gamma has to occur in the actual runtime store S, and the value stored at that location has to match the type that the, uh, that the uh, context gamma is expecting. Okay, and finally, we can, uh, we can wrap up the, uh, uh, the typing rules with the rules for, uh, um, I, uh, for sequencing and iteration. So the skip has the unit type. It's saying this doesn't do anything. It's a, val a unit value. Sequencing says, well, if E1 um, is of type unit and E2 is of type T, then sequencing the two has the type T. Um, and so note here that uh, since skip is our only uh, is our only value of type unit, and we only have a reduction rule, an evaluation rule that says skip semicolon e2 goes to e2, this e1 needs to be of unit type. So if we made it of integer type, e1 would eventually evaluate to a number, and then our uh, our allegedly well typed program would get stuck when we tried to execute it. And so now what we're going to do for while loops is we're going to say E1 is a Boolean test um, and E2 is of type unit. And so we're going to repeatedly execute E2 as long as E1 is true. And so the types say the whole while expression has the type unit when the test is a Boolean and the body that you repeat is a unit. All right. And so now what we can talk about is the properties that we want the uh, uh, the the uh, type system to satisfy, because so far what we've done is we've given a typing relation gamma under under gamma e has the type ta t, 
And we've given a reduction semantics that says a configuration ES can step to another configuration E prime S prime, but we need to state and prove theorems relating the type system and the uh, operational semantics. So just writing down a set of typing rules doesn't do anything. It has no impact on the runtime behavior of the program. So if you re recall, like none of the reduction rules say anything about types at all. And in fact, we didn't even define our grammar of types in the last lecture. We only defined it in this lecture. And so that means that um, establishing a connection between the type system and the operational semantics is something that we have to prove. And uh, the way that we're going to do this is by stating two theorems, which are traditionally called progress and preservation, and they will give us a type safety property, which says that well-typed programs won't go get stuck. Um, and so the progress theorem says that if E is a well-typed uh, term, so E has the type T, and um, the assumptions about the store, the domain of gamma, is smaller than the actual runtime domain. So the domain of gamma are the do, uh, set of assumptions we made about the locations that exist, and the domain of S is the set of locations that actually exist at runtime. So if the assumptions we made were conservative, then either E is going to be a value or um, there exist E prime and S prime such that ES can take a step. So we're saying that if a program is well typed, then either it's a value or it can make forward progress. There's, it's not stuck. So it's either a value or it can step, so therefore E is not stuck. Um, and then type preservation says that, well, if E is well typed, and it conservatively made conservative assumptions about the runtime store, and E actually takes a step, then the new thing that it took a step to, so if E S goes to E prime S prime, then the new pro, new configuration is well typed. So E prime will still have the type T, and S prime will still over approximate the domain big gamma, the domain of big gamma. And so what these two things do is they let us show that a well-typed program will never get stuck because a well-typed program will always be a value or make forward progress. And uh, that's what progress says. And what type preservation says is that if a well-typed program made progress, the thing it made progress to is going to be uh, well-typed. And so... Uh, progress says, well, well-typed programs will, will make forward progress, and preservation says things that make well-typed programs that make progress are going to remain typed. And so as a result, we know that if you have a well-typed program, um, then for any sequence of reductions, um, either you've reduced to, as, uh, to, a val to a value or you can continue executing. So there's never a case where you actually get stuck and can't make any forward progress. Um, so one thing that I want to do uh, before I go on is I want to talk a little bit about how to uh, how to actually read these uh, uh, read these uh, uh, rules. So so one thing that you'll see is uh, that. Uh, uh, I wrote this as if gamma uh, turnstile ET and domain of gamma, then blah, 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 blah. Uh, and the question is, what are the quantifiers in this, uh, in this theorem? And so if we want to write this down, so let's state progress. So what we wrote was that if, uh, if gamma has the type T, and the domain of, of gamma the do, uh, is a subset of the domain, uh, the domain of the actual runtime state, then uh, E is a value, or uh, there exist Either hey 
or there exist uh, E prime and S prime such that uh, such that uh, E S goes to E prime S prime, and so we have some we have some uh, uh, we have some quantifiers explicitly given here. So we say okay, there exist, but um, there's a whole lot more quantifiers up at the beginning, and so the the uh, So what we what we're actually stating with uh, everything written explicitly is that uh, um, for every gamma e t and s and so if we wanted to be even more precise we would say like uh, uh, oh like in expression in type in store, oh yes, in type expression, type environment. Um, now what we're saying is that uh, uh, for every one of these possibilities, if we satisfy, for every possible gamma E, T, and S, if uh, E has type T under gamma and the domain of gamma is a, a subset of the domain of the of the runtime store s, then either e is a value or there exist uh, um, e prime s prime such that uh, e s steps to e prime s prime. And this is a really common pattern in uh, in mathematics. You'll see it you'll see it very very frequently. So uh, when you see a theorem of the form if something then something else then all of the variables that occur in the set of assumptions gamma e, uh, has type et and the domain of gamma is a subset of s um, all of those assumptions are implicitly universally quantified and then all of the uh, variables that are only referred to in the conclusion those are existentially quantified and uh, um, this this is a, a common convention in mathematics, and until you like really internalize it, it's also an extremely confusing convention. So it's actually worth uh, going through these, uh, going through these, uh, uh, going through these theorems and putting in the uh, quantifiers yourself in order to make sure that you uh, you understand where all the quantifiers go, because this uh, because knowing where they are will actually be extremely important when we try to actually prove these theorems. Um, but before we do that, what I want to do is I want to spend just a few minutes um, talking about like type checking, type inference, and how, how you can actually implement that in this programming language. So the type so the type checking program uh, uh, is and type inference have are, are related but not quite the same. So if you have a type system, type checking says, well, if you give me the assumptions, the expression, and the type, I will tell you whether or not the program is well typed. So can I find a derivation that E has the type T under gamma? Um, type inference says, well, if you give me gamma and E, find me a T that that makes uh, a E well typed with T, or prove that it's not possible. Um, and because because uh, because you're asked to do more with type inference, type inference is usually harder than type checking. And so solving it usually requires implementing a type inference algorithm. So you're computing a T for a phrase E given the type environment um, or failing if there is no typing. Um, but it turns out that for L1, both of these are actually quite, e quite easy to achieve. So uh, um, what we can prove uh, and, and then we'll actually implement is that for L1, we can given any environment gamma and any expression E, we can find a T such that E has the type T, or we can prove that there isn't any such thing. And we can also prove that type checking is decidable. So given gamma E and T, we can decide that e, whether E has the type T. And this means either giving the derivation or proving that no such direct, uh, uh, no such, uh, 
no such type uh, exists. No such typing derivation exists. And when you implement it, just as we saw uh, with the uh, operational semantics, when we implemented the operational semantics, we needed to prove that the semantics was deterministic in order to transcribe it into ML code. And something similar will happen here. Well, if we can, if we want to implement an ML function that does type inference, um, it's useful to uh, prove a theorem of the uniqueness of typing that says if you have two typing derivations for the same term e, so if e, the same term, has the types t and t prime, then t equals t prime. So this means there's only one type for any expression in our language, um, given our typing rules. And so when we implement the type inference, it's going to be very similar to implementing, uh, implementing reductions, except that now what we're going to do is we're going to choose some representations for types and contexts. So we'll say that the types of L1 are integers, units, and booleans, the types of locations are in integer references, and a type environment is just a list of pairs, location, uh, uh, locations and their types, with the invariant that all the locations are unique. And now we can use this, we can use these data structures to implement type inference. And so type inference is just going to be a function that takes a type inference, a type environment, an expression, and tells you the type that the program has, or it tells you that it, do that it doesn't exist. And um, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next lecture, what I will do is I will describe the type inference algorithm, and then we'll start, uh, we'll start thinking about how to actually prove this. Thank you.